next speaker um, is Andrew Clark, and he's going to, from Delta Hat, and he's going to be talking about cross referencing and aggregating multiple independent sources to estimate subgroup level values, uh, specifically about the EQ five D utility of a drug in severe hemophilia A. Thanks. Hi, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Yeah, great. great. Okay, so welcome to my presentation on cross-referencing and aggregating multiple independent sources to estimate subgroup level values. So in this talk, what I'm essentially going to do is describe an approach that I developed in R to estimate the utility for a particular group of individuals that was previously unreported. So this work focuses on a drug called emicizumab, which is a novel treatment for severe haemophilia A that restores the function of missing activated factor eight. Uh, that's an essential blood clotting protein, which is deficient in people with haemophilia A, which leads them to have uh, bleeds. And in this talk, we're going to focus in particular on two studies, both of which concern emicizumab prophylaxis for treating se severe haemophilia A. Uh, the first of these studies was HAVEN-3, and this enrolled 152 patients that were split across uh, into two groups. So the first group are patients that were previously treated with episodic factor VIII, and these patients were randomized to arms A, B, and C. And the remaining 63 patients who had all previously received prophylactic treatment were uh, assigned to arm D directly. And it's this arm that we're particularly interested in because unlike uh, arms A, B, and C, we have no information on their utility. There's also the HAVEN-4 study, which is, um, is important to us because it has overlap with the patients in arm D of HAVEN-3. Uh, and this study enrolled 48 patients that were split across two cohorts. The first is the running cohort, and the second is the expansion cohort. Um, because of the data that's available to us, we're only going to consider the expansion cohort from Haven 4 alongside uh, Haven 3 arms. And it's worth mentioning that Haven 4's expansion cohort is made up of patients that were both treated had either episodic or prophylactic prior treatment. So as I alluded to in the uh, previous slide, the core objective or the core problem that we're dealing with in this talk is the fact that although we have information on the utility for patients in arm A, B, and C, uh, we lack any information on the utility for patients in arm D. And of course, this, uh, this information is really important if we want to do things like perform indirect treatment comparisons in populations like arm D. So this brings us to the aim of this presentation and the work we've done, which is to estimate the unreported RD utilities. So before I go on to actually outline the approach we developed in R, I want to give a quick overview of the data that's available to us. Uh, briefly speaking, that comes in two main forms. So we've got information that's available in a series of published articles, uh, as well as some tables we've extracted from publicly available clinical trials documents. So I'll give an overview of the most important bits of information here and explain kind of how we use them. The first thing that we've got um, are a series of figures from uh, Skinner et al. And that study um, provides these figures, which essentially give us the a series of utilities that are reported uh, for you patients with the particular patient characteristic. Um, so for example, what you can see uh, in orange on this graph are uh, utilities for all of those patients that were previously treated with uh, prophylaxis treatments. And uh, it's worth noting that that's made up of patients across the entire of Haven 3, as well as the Haven 4 expansion cohort. Sorry, it's not changing. So we also have these utilities which have been reported explicitly for arms A, B, and C on selected uh, time points, but we don't have anything for arm D here. We have standard information like the patient characteristics by study arm. And then we have this useful table that tells us essentially the number of patients in each of the study arms on each of the key weeks that uh, reported or failed to report their EQ5D utility. And so when we take all of this information together, what we're essentially trying to do is take the utilities in the top left and try to reverse engineer from these using all of the rest of the information what the utilities would need to be for each of the individual arms in order to recover that information. And this will give us the Haven 3 RD utility that we're interested in. So the way that we initially attempted to do this was to essentially take all of the information and express it as a series of simultaneous equations. Um, I know it won't be obvious why we did this or kind of the, like 
how. So I'm going to walk through a quick example that hopefully uh, brings you on board with the idea. So what we saw in the previous slide was that for all of the patients that previously received prophylaxis treatment, they had a mean utility of 0.74 at baseline. And what we can tell from the number of patients reporting their utilities and their patient characteristics is that 68% of these patients must have come from RMD, whilst 32% must have come from the Haven 4 expansion cohort. And so we can capture this information in a really simple linear equation. Uh, and if we repeat this process for each of the uh, patient characteristics for which we have um, one of these aggregated utilities, so basically one of the plots from the Skinner et al. study, we end up with a system of equations that looks uh, something like this. And what this basically tells us is the breakdown of the arm specific utilities, the, the arm specific contributions to those utilities. And the reason that we do this is that it gives us all of the information we need in theory to estimate the or solve for the missing uh, values which correspond to those arm specific utilities we're interested in. And so you can think of this as a way to kind of transpose the utility information from the domain of the patient characteristics to the domain of the, uh, the arms. And so the way that we initially tried to do this was by converting this into a, uh, a matrix and then providing this as an input to the qr.solve function in R. Uh, but in doing this, we found two main problems. The first problem was that the utilities we got out were generally way beyond one or sometimes below zero. And so ultimately they weren't plausible uh, utilities. And we also found that because the right-hand side of this equation was using utilities that have been reported to decimal places, we were missing some of the exact information we needed to actually uh, kind of get the, the, the perfect view of, of what the, the situation looked like. And what this meant was that there were conflicting pieces of information in the equations. And so we got implausible utilities out the other side. So what this means is that we need an approach that can take this information, provide us estimates for the arm specific utilities, but in a way that can handle these two issues. And so this is where we turn to linear programming. So we use an R package called RGLPK, um, which is an R interface to quite a popular tool called the GNU Linear Programming Kit. Uh, I won't go into the specifics of what linear programming does here, but the basic idea is really similar to the simultaneous equations where we are essentially specifying a series of constraints as equations that map out the problem space. Then the linear program uses some clever maths to uh, efficiently identify a series of utilities which are consistent with those constraints. And the reason that we use the, uh, the linear programming approach is that it gives us some additional functionality that allows us to accommodate for these two issues. And so specifically to deal with the implausible utilities, we utilize the fact that the um, that RGLPK has solution boundaries. And so we can specify an upper and lower bound on the, the range of utilities. So such that, for example, they fall between zero and one. And secondly, to deal with the rounding issue, we use the fact that in RGLPK, we can specify the constraints not only as linear equations, but also using inequalities. And this allows us to relax the conditions that we're working with so that we target a range of utilities rather than an exact utility. And so we can replace our constraint with a range to three decimal places that would round to the target utility to two decimal places. So I appreciate that what I've said up until this point has been pretty abstract. So I'm going to give a, a quick take a step back and give an overview of the steps so far. So the first thing that we do is we take from these uh, published sources, we, we attempt to extract a series of utilities that have been aggregated over key patient characteristics. We then establish the percentage of patients in each arm that actually contributed to those utilities and then express this information as uh, a series of simple linear equations. We can then replace the equalities with a pair of inequalities that account for rounding and provide this directly as an input to RGLPK alongside a pair of solution boundaries that ensure we get uh, solutions within a, a plausible range. This gives us uh, a, an estimate of the ARM3D utility for a particular week, and we would then repeat the entire process for each of the, the weeks in the study that we want to reach an estimate. So, of course, to apply this approach, we need some data. Uh, and in this context, to get this, we simulate some pseudo-patient-level data, which is initially uh, 
the distribution of uh, patient characteristics at baseline, which is consistent with what's reported in the uh, clinical trials documents. But there are a couple of sources of variance that we need to account for that introduce some uncertainty to the patient characteristics of the reporting population. So we've already seen that there's a handful of patients on each week that fail to report their utility. And what this means is we don't know exactly which patients are the ones who contribute to the utility values we see in the Skinner et al. figures. And secondly, we know from the UDRA CT information, which is one of the clinical trials provider the documents, uh, that a small number of patients actually switch their dosing regimen. But we don't know which dosing regimen they switch to. And so there's some uncertainty from, I think, week 25 onwards about what uh, dosing regimen particular individuals are. The way that we deal with this is that we take the initial distribution of patient characteristics at baseline, put this into a data frame and duplicate this 100,000 times. And then for each of these data frames, we uh, sample patients at random who we kind of force to fail to report and switch their dosing regimen. Um, this leaves us with a kind of pool of 100,000 different solutions with quite varying patient characteristics. And so what we do is we screen these and discard any data frames that directly um, contradict what's been published in, in the studies. So for example, if we have any data frames that have too many patients with target joints at week 25, we get rid of those data frames. And so this leaves us with a candidate set of potentially valid data frames, which I've summarized in this table. And what you can see is that there is still some residual uncertainty in the patient characteristics. And that's because we don't know precisely which patients, uh, we can't narrow it down, sorry, to kind of one group of patients because we simply don't have the information available, available to do that. And so what it means in terms of applying the approach is that we have multiple different data frames, each of which is possibly valid. So we'll apply the approach to each of them and report an average estimate alongside a range. And so this is exactly what we did. Uh, and specifically, we configured our linear program to have initial solution boundaries of 0.55 to 0.85, which is a trade-off between what we expect, expect plausible range of the utility to be for this group of patients, uh, alongside the fact that the narrower we can make this in practice, the more efficient the solving will be. And what we find is that our estimated utilities are initially predicted to be 0.79 at week zero and rise up to 0.82 in week 49. And if we look at the range associated with the point estimates, we can see that for all but one weeks, they're identical. It's only in week 25 where we see a small amount of variance of 0.01. As this all tells us that our estimated utilities were largely unaffected by the residual variance in patient characteristics that we saw on the previous slide. And so a question you might have at this stage is, what impact did the choice of solution boundary have on the estimated utilities? So to explore this, what we did was we uh, took the initial solution boundaries and relaxed them increasingly uh, in two separate scenarios. And what we found in these more relaxed scenarios was that the estimates were largely unchanged. It was only in week 13 where the estimated utility changed from 0.8 to 0.81, and that was also carried through to the associated range. And so similar to, to the previous slide, this gives us some confidence that the predicted utilities were largely robust to the choice of solution boundaries. In terms of future work, there's, uh, there are limitations associated with this methodology um, that if we have more time, we would like to have explored. And so the main one of these being the fact that we've only really considered constraints at the aggregate level here. So kind of things that are placed across the, the study arms. But we know there's also useful information in these sources that we could use to place constraints at the patient level if we included an element of individual level simulation. And this could lead to further insights. So another uh, pair of limitations that surround the data rather than the methodology are the fact that firstly, we are fundamentally using information that's not quite perfect because it's already been rounded. And whilst we try to account for this, if we had the true value, we may have, it could have an impact on the results. And similarly, we're using lots of different information from lots of different sources, but we can't guarantee that we're always comparing like for like values. So in some cases, we might have a value that's been modeled from one source versus observed in another. And the distinction isn't always clear. 
And again, that might be something that has an impact on the results. But despite these limitations, we were ultimately able to provide an estimate using this linear programming approach for the Haven 3 AMD utilities uh, that were previously unreported. And specifically, we estimated an increase of 0.03 from week zero point, sorry, from week zero to week 49, uh, which was from an increase of 0.79 up to 0.82. So thank you for listening. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll take them. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, as a, a mathematician and statistician by background, yeah, really useful um, that you were able to uh, have a mathematical solution to your problem. I was just wondering um, if you'd, ha have you actually like tested how well this myth mythology works? Like say, like if you ignored RMD, where you don't have the information, have you have you looked at the other arms where you did have the information and used this mythology and see how well it predicted for the things that you do have? No, so we not explicitly tested it with sort of like leaving one out, but the reason for that is that we've it's not kind of a I would I wouldn't necessarily call it a methodology because I think it's the circumstances of the data that we've got that let us do this. So specifically because arm d is it's very disassociated with arms a b and c but it's so because of the way that the individuals were assigned to arm d on the basis that they were treated with prophylaxis there's this really clear cut so you can very easily kind of disambiguate who belongs to a b and c who belongs to d um and so it allows you to get some kind of estimates for that for the arm d whereas i think the approach would not work particularly well for arms a b and c on the basis that it'd be very difficult to kind of disambiguate those patients because they're they've got very similar characteristics but yeah i think in terms of next steps for this it's certainly something to do is to try and valid i guess tease out the methodology and validate that against some sort of like ground truth yeah so sven has just put a posted a question no two questions in the chat um so I, I'll read them out for you or give you some time to read them. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah. apologies. Sorry, did you want me to, to answer them straight away? Or... Um, yeah, you could do. Yeah, I think everybody can read them. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah, so, so question one regarding the whether it's finding non-unique solutions. Um, this is something I looked at, and in some cases, potentially, yes. And it's something that we need to look into in terms of how do you how do you quantify or, or quantify that information where there are potentially non-unique solutions? So if you have multiple possible solutions, kind of which one of these is more likely than the other to, to be the right solution is something we would need to look into. What I would say here is because of the amount of constraints we have, the sort of solution space is really narrow. So even when there are, say, non-unique solutions, they're within such a tight range that it's not going to create, I don't think, a material difference. And in terms of uncertainty around the different estimates, the different time points. So those, I guess that's in relation to these sort of error bars here. This is purely a reflection of kind of the impact of um, the residual variance in the patient characteristics. And so this is, again, I think a limitation of linear programming is that you don't get a natural indication of uncertainty in kind of the standard way you would with most statistical approaches. So this purely says across the data frames that we established that could be valid, what's the kind of minimum and maximum estimate we observe? So I don't think it really falls into either of the categories that you've, you've put in the question, but hopefully that answers the question. 